especially when you have larger, any Torah really, because the little tears and rips are damaged that it's unnecessary. Okay. Now, but I would like to show you a few things here. Let's see. Because I brought it, I might as well show it. So here is one of the Torahs I was working on earlier today. So you can already see here. Can you see what's going on there? You see all that dirt? Now, many times you're going to see in the reports, as far as the evaluations of the conditions of the scroll, it's going to be broken down into four slash five different categories. One category is going to be what or how much cleaning does the Torah need? So as you can see, the amount of dirt that is now appearing over the letters, sometimes you can't even read the words as a result of it. But I think what's more important to note is that dirt doesn't just happen. Where does that black dirt come from? I don't think anyone was eating a cookie over the Torah. And it's not the crumbs of the dirt on the Torah. So where did that black dirt come from? Ha, huh, the ink is black. Wow, wait, so how did it get onto the actual parchment? Because the ink now, here comes the interesting element of the two parts that can cause a Torah to become unkosher. And not only that, by the way, if you can see here now, oops, if you can see the bottom of that letter, it looks, almost looks like a tet and a yud, but actually this is meant to be a letter shin. Can you see that? the line is missing. You see that? So this whole line here has now, it's ink that has now fallen apart. So the first thing I had to do was I had to clean it. Oh, oh look at that. You see how clean it is now? Look at that. But then comes the best part. I fixed it up and I wrote it in. You see that? Okay, so that's the th three stages. One is first identifying it, that's cleaning it, and then actually writing it. So what happens now is that ink is organic even as the parchment is organic. Now, the truth is the magic of the ink, the dio that we use to write Torahs, is very special in that if the Torah is maintained and in a proper environment, Torahs can last for forever, literally, with no issues. The oldest Torah that I personally have worked on is a Torah out of um, uh, Dallas and Temple Emmanuel there. They have a Torah from northern Italy. It's over 750 years old. You open up the cover and you're looking at the parchment you think, okay, there's probably nothing here. It's frazzled at the top, frazzled at the bottom. You open it up, it looks like it was written yesterday. Beautiful. Again, one of the very few that survived the craziness of the world over the generations. And it's like, but most Torahs, unfortunately, coming through the Holocaust, coming through the pogroms, and so on and so forth, obviously have taken a toll on these Torahs. So one of two things could happen. One is that the ink can begin to dry, and that's when it flakes, and it falls off, and the, the particle of the ink that remains now in the parchment now causes all that dirt that one sees inside a Torah. So when you're looking at a Torah and you, you almost feel like you have to swim through the dirt to see the words, it's because the ink had dried off and it remained because it didn't go anywhere. And it just continues to rub against other letters, again, causing further damage to other. So the first step in such restoration would be first to clean the Torah completely and then identify the areas that were damaged and therefore the letters had fallen off, rubbed off and so on and rewrite those letters to the point that you wouldn't be able to see that I was there. It will look like exactly the original letters that were written before me. The second problem, and so far I haven't seen too many of those here, which is a nice thing, um, where because of Sofer any software knows that if you use, when you write your ink, if the ink is very thick, that ink will tend to become like little mound bulbs on top of the parchment, and that is the kind of ink that could now dry out and cause the problem. So often, some software will go and, and take their ink and dilute it. Make it very thin, so you're not making a very thick layer of ink. 
The disadvantage of that is if you're doing it too much is that that ink begins to dry out, but in this case, it turns to brown, and that's when you get letters that are fading. And if you open up some of your Torahs, and I know there's one Holocaust Torah that we have over here, and the letters are just brown and all over the place, fading. In, in many places, you can't even see it. So once again, brown is not pasul in any way. Even early fading, as long as you can read it. But once it comes to the point when you're saying, I can't see what's written there, in essence, that's when it's not kosher anymore. We will be identifying that. So the first area of the report that every community will receive about their Torahs, one's going to be the amount of cleaning that has to take place. The next part is going to be the external maintenance that's relating to the parchment, any tears, rips, stitching, and so on. I have a number of photos here I can show you of some really very large rips through the Torah. Um, I couldn't leave it like that, so I've already stitched them up, but I took photos of it beforehand. The next category is going to be fixing and repairing the pasul letters. And the fourth area is repairing other letters. Now let me focus on the difference between the two. Because you're all going to be seeing these reports in the next, when, as soon as I get to write them all up. As I mentioned, if a letter is broken and rubbed off, that's when it is not kosher. But a letter is not kosher and then not kosher immediately. There's many different gray areas in between where the letter begins to flake and you'll start seeing little white spots inside the letters and then it starts to crumble a little bit. There's a bit of cracking, all of which are still kosher. And you still may read from that Torah and you may still make a bracha on it. And if I'm in town and I'm with your Torah, I'll make a bracha on it. It's 100% kosher. But as we say in Hebrew, elama, what's going to be now is that that Torah, we don't and we can't guarantee how long it will, will remain kosher. Because the moment it's crumbling, it could be good for another day, it could be good for another six months, but you can already visually see that it's on the downside. It's deteriorating, and it's just a matter of time before that letter flakes off or rubs off and so on, and then you'll be calling me again. Sometimes we simply need for a minimal amount to get the to Torah kosher because we have a high holiday coming, because we need to read from it. So we will offer to fix only the, the pasul, the non-kosher letters, and then recommend strongly that at some point, at some time, we go back and fix everything else. But that's to give you the different options and possibilities. The fifth category is going to be the category relating to other areas. Um, sometimes a new sheet has to be written because the whole Torah is beautiful, and one sheet needs to be replaced. Sometimes you have a rip right through the letters that need to be fixed. So those are extraordinary situations that will be documented in that type of a report. Okay. How much time do I have? Because, uh, okay, but let me go on a little bit more. Let me tell you a little bit about um, what makes me tick. So as you heard, I've been a sofer now for 41 years. So how does one become a sofer? Good question. Because there isn't a college course, there isn't a yeshiva program. You can't just go to a class and learn to become a sofer. There's only one way, and that's to become to and that is to become an apprentice under another sofer. So you have to find another sofer as a time of day for you, willing to teach you, and spend time with you, and train you. Wait, so who taught my teacher? Oh, his teacher. Well, okay, okay. But who taught his teacher? His teacher. And who was the first teacher? Good old Moses. And who taught Moses? So if you think of it, I'm in God's profession. <laughs> a little respect, just a little. So from a very young age, I was, I, although born in New York, made Aliyah with my family when I was six. We lived in a little village north of Israel called Migdal, just north of Tiberias. And that's where I grew up, not observant. But from a very young age, I've been an artist. I used to go with my cousin. We used to climb mountains and draw sceneries. I've been an artist from a very young age. About nine years old, in public school in Israel, I came by a photocopy of a page of the letters of Hebrew as they appear in the Torah. And as we would say in the classics, it was love at first sight. I fell in love with the shapes of those letters. I was mesmerized by them to the point where everyone in class was scribbling scribbles. I was scribbling Hebrew letters, not knowing what it would mean or anything. I just loved these letters. 
Let's jump ahead. I'm now 17, going into 18 years old. I become a Baal Teshuva. I'm, getting, I'm in yeshiva. I get kicked out of yeshiva <laughs> because I was the cartoonist. And I was drawing funny faces of all the rabbis and posting them up around there. And they didn't like that. I was a good student, I was a good boy, but th that kind of behavior of you know, making funny faces of your rabbis, and that just didn't work right. So I was told, Maisha, you should become the ultimate Jewish artist. You should become a sofer. I said, ah, oh, come on, that's, for that stuff you gotta be holy. I mean, that doesn't... I was a fish in water. I'd seen those letters. I can right now show all of you how to write a letter and give you the quill. Oi, <laughs> I've done it too many times where people say, I can't do this. But I'm showing you, go like this and like this. It doesn't work. With me, it was immediately. I had been writing these letters, I knew exactly what they looked like. So here's my true story. As you were told, what's the first item that a sofer practices to write? And that is a Megillah. Very good. Okay. So I am a yeshiva bacher. I'm in Israel. At that, at that time, I was getting close to Chabad. And I wanted to go and travel from Israel to New York to visit, at that time, the late Lubavitch Rebbe. Mazel tov. The ticket back in the early 80s was $850. Let alone that that was a lot of money, even then. But more importantly, I didn't have it. <laughs> I was supporting myself. I wasn't getting any money from home. So I used to do a lot of odd jobs. And being a sofer is also a job. So I said, OK, I'm writing a Megillah. I'm going to sell a Megillah. And I checked around. What are Megillahs selling for? Well, they're selling for 1000 for 1200 1500 Today they can go into three and four and 5000 But surely to make 1000 Easy money, I'll get my ticket, I'll have some money for the taxi, I'm fine. So I write my Megillah. And I was showing it to my friends. Very good. So I finished it. I tried to go ahead and sell it. So I showed it to this person, to that person. And often what was going on in my circles, they were asking me, so how many Megillahs have you written? And I honestly would tell them, this is my first one. They'd say, okay, I'll give you $90. <laughs> you mean 900? No, 90. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's your first one. We don't know how many mistakes you made, right? It's the first Megillah. Many suffering write 20, 30, 40 because they're making mistakes and erasing and fixing and 90 bucks. After five, come talk to me and I'll give you a little more. I'm not going to sell it to them. So I'm starting to go around trying to get offers. I got an offer the most where I was living, $150. That wasn't doing it. So I started making photocopies. I started sending it around. A person from Tel Aviv calls me up and he says, Moshe, I saw the sample, and it's obviously all happening in Hebrew. If you bring it to me and I like it, I'll give you $250. But that's the most I was getting. So I was going to cut my losses, take the money, and move on. So I'm on the bus going to Tel Aviv, and this is a true story. And in the middle of the day, I got permission. And a person gets on the bus and he sits down next to me in the middle of the ride. So he sits down next to me and he looks at me and he says, Hey, and you know, again, in, all in Hebrew, Tabachur Yeshiva, are you a Yeshiva Bachar? And I say, Yes, I am. He says, So what's Yeshiva Bachar doing on a bus going to Tel Aviv in the summer in the middle of the. <laughs> like, what's going on over here? So I said, No, 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 I'm a sofer. He says, You're a sofer? What did you write? I said, I wrote a Megillah. So why are you on the bus? Well, someone in Tel Aviv might buy it from me if he sees it. He says, Do you have it? I do. Can I see it? You can. And I give it to him. He opens it up, he looks from cover to him, he says, this is a how much do you want for it? I didn't blink, I said, $850. <laughs> he didn't blink. He takes out his wallet in Israel, early 1980s, and he hands over to me 850 US dollars. So what was my reaction? <laughs> right, this is unbelievable. I mean, wow, to get a home run on the first round, and I never, the guy takes my Megillah, gets off the next bus stop, and I never saw him again. So, for those who believe in Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah, hey, I believed at that moment for sure. But the story, while it ended, there is a continuation. So I'm in New York. And this part I'm going to back up. I have proof for it in the other room in my case. Those who were training me, after seeing my first Megillah, they turned around and said, Moshe, Forget about writing two, three, and four Megillot. You're ready to write your first mezuzah. You can jump the line. So I'm in New York now, and I'm starting to write my first mezuzah scroll. 
Now, I have written in my career over 50,000 mezuzah scrolls. And I'm very quick and I'm very good, and I can write a mezuzah in about an hour, hour and a half. I, once I get into it, and I'm running. This mezuzah took me seven hours to write. Not because I was slow, but rather because this is the first one. <laughs> and I'm going to be checked on this one. You know, and if I make any silly, odd mistake, that's not where I'm doing it. So I write this mezuzah. And when I finish writing it, I start to check it. I want to make sure that not only all the words, but all the crowns and the nuances and the corners and the edges, everything is perfect. Again and again until I was satisfied. And then I go and take it over to the person who's going to inspect it. Now, one of my shortcomings are that I don't remember names very well after meeting, what, half a million people in my... You don't remember names, but this person I'll never forget. His name was Rabbi Eli Shevitz. And he, I give him my mezuzah, and he says to me, Okay, Moshe, I'm going to take you to a panel of other sofrim. We're going to inspect it, and then we'll call you up and let you know. I said, Fine. I give him the mezuzah. He calls me up a little while later and says, Moshe, I have good news and I have bad news. Okay, what's the good news? He says, Moshe, for your first mezuzah, it looks like you've been writing for 20 years. Beautiful. I said, oh, 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 thank you, thank you. This is fantastic. What's the bad news? The bad news is it's puzzle and there's nothing you can do with it. I said, what are you talking about? He says, what do you mean? What are you talking? Come, I'll show you. Come. I ran. I go running to him. And usually at this part, I didn't think of it earlier, but usually at this part of my story, I actually take out the mezuzah because I have it with me. It's never left my sight in 41 years. And he hands me back my mezuzah and he shows it to me. He says, here, look at your mezuzah. So I take out this little mezuzah. It's about this big, beautifully written. And I read it from beginning to end. I say, I don't see any problem. He says, read it again. I said, okay. And I read it again. I says, come on. You're pulling my leg here, right? You're just trying to deflate. I was a little bit. Read it again. Three times I read it, each time slower than the first. I don't see any problem. I says, okay, what's up? There, there's nothing. There's no problem. He goes and shows me I actually missed a letter. You know, there's a saying that goes, cowboys don't cry. Well, I burst out crying. Not too much because I was caught in this embarrassment of not seeing the mistake, but probably more equal to that joy that I had when that person bought my Megillah, and I went, yes! Exact the reverse, I felt that this was maybe a sign, get out while you're ahead. I wrote it, I took my time, I checked it. I was told there's a problem, and I kept on checking it with the notion that there was, and I couldn't see it. I said, maybe God is giving me a clear sign here and now, get out. This is not what you should be doing. It was a nice, beautiful, cute little run. You could tell it to your grandkids when you grow up. But now you shouldn't be involved in doing this. And I was really distraught. But what happened next is really what fashioned my entire outlook on who I became. He put his hand on my shoulder. And he said to me, Moshe, you're going to be a good sofer. I said, well, how? And I, between my tears, I said, how can you say that? Look, you told me there was a mistake. I didn't see it. I really shouldn't. I should take the signal and get out. He says, what you're forgetting is a very important part of being a sofer. And that is, and it's a famous line that I'm sure all of us have heard this multiple times in different areas, but it was very applicable to me at that moment. And that is that it says the Torah, lo asharet, which means the Torah was not given to the angels. Why wasn't Torah given to angels? Because huh, angels don't make mistakes. We make mistakes. And therefore, we're the ones who can actually use the Torah to learn how to not make mistakes. Angels that never make a mistake don't need the Torah to inspire them, to encourage them, to guide them, to show them the way how to become better. Humans who are naturally capable of making mistakes need the Torah. He said to me, had you turned around and told me, ah, I made a mistake, no big deal, I'll go write another one. He said, then I would have worried about you. He said, there's one other part to that statement that most people forget. It's not only that humans make mistakes. We have one other advantage over angels. And that is, we as people, as sons, as fathers, daughters, mothers, we can turn around to someone we care or to someone we don't know. 
and we can say, I am sorry. And that is something so difficult to turn around and own up and say, I am sorry. I made a mistake. I'm going to try to fix it. This world is called Olam HaTikun, the world of fixing. Has anyone ever heard of Tikkun Olam before? Because this is the world that you can fix. You can say you're sorry, and you can try to make things better despite what happened before. He said to me, had I not cared about it and said, oh, I'll just write another one, you shouldn't be a sofer. He said, the fact that it bothered you so much is to me, he says, is a sign that I'll be a good sofer, that I'm going to really take this seriously. And here I am 41 years later telling you the story. And if you'd like to see that mezuzah soon after it's all over, I can show you my mezuzah inside there. But last but not least, <clears throat> the Hebrew letters, which ultimately this is all about, and that's where a lot of the why comes in. And maybe next time when I'm here, I can share with you an entire two, three hour lecture about the magic of the Hebrew letters. But these Hebrew letters were given by God. And ultimately, if God is putting his essence into these letters, you better believe that there has to be some magical concepts to them. And the biggest proof is you. The fact that you nuts in 2022 are still Jewish is the biggest proof that it's real. We have all the reasons to take it, chuck it, and walk away from it. When you have an entire world saying you're crazy, you're nuts, we dislike you, we want to leave, and it's over. Why are you holding on to it? Unless somewhere we know that there really is some powerful magic to it. And as a result, I and you are still standing here and sitting here together. Does anyone know the first thing when God made this world, right? How did God make the world? How did he do it? What was God's magic? All God did with no hammer, no chisel, no press the button, he actually spoke. God's magic was speaking. Okay? Have any of you ever seen a magician before? Okay. I won't be doing any magic today because I do know a whole bunch of magic tricks. My kids know even more than I do. But, but I'm sure all of you do know what are the two famous words that all magicians use? No? Abraka? You all knew that was Hebrew, right? No, no, I'm serious. That's Hebrew? How's that work? So let's put it this way. I think we have here all mostly adults here. I don't want to break the bubble for a kid, but we all know that magicians are not really doing magic, right? They're just imitating magic, right? They have the balls up their sleeve, they have the chicken under their kippah and things like that, right? Okay, but what, what are they trying to imitate? The real magic. And what, what is real magic? Can you imagine if I would just speak and say, I would like right now, right here to have a tree, and out sprouts a tree. Now that's powerful magic. So we try to make illusions. What are the first three words of the Torah? Bereshit, bara, elokim. Bereshit means the beginning, bara means to create, elokim is God. In the beginning, God created. Bara means what? To create. How would you say in Hebrew, I create? All you would do is take the word bara, add the letter aleph in front of it with the kamatz vowel under it, and say, abra, in Hebrew means I create. How did God create? He spoke. How do you say speak in Hebrew? Diber. How would you say, as I speak? You add one letter with one vowel and say, ke dabra means as I speak. Abra kedabra means I create as I speak. All magicians are imitating the real magic, which is Torah. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> If anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy to. So I have a microphone here for anybody that wants to ask any questions, and I can just bring the mic around. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. A question you've always Over wanted here? to ask a sofa. This is how I feel like Vanna White, right? Okay. <laughs> Except no letters. I mean, other than abracadabra. Okay. <laughs> Our brains are wired psychologically to... I'm not hearing you clearly. I apologize. Oh, sorry. Hello? Yeah. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs>
our brains are wired psychologically so that when we read, if there is a missing letter, our brain will automatically fill that in. How have you, how have you studied so that that doesn't happen again? Because that's likely how you miss the first. Okay, so a, a number of issues relating to the mistake, which you're asking about my mistake and anyone else's mistake. So in essence, of course, as humans, we don't trust ourselves. And as a result, what we do is that a so if I wrote a mezuzah and I am known as the most professional, most beautifully written mezuzah in the whole world and I'm selling it to you, I am prohibited from selling it to you directly. That's against Jewish law. What has to happen prior? There has to be, before you ever receive that mezuzah, it has to go through what we call hagaha, which means it's two independent scribes examining that mezuzah before you get it. I did not add earlier, my nickname in the scribal world is Eagle's Eyes. Because I, people sometimes don't like to call me up to the Torah if they know their Torah is a little bit in the shady. Because if there's mistakes, I'll find it. I can see other mistakes. Let's be clear, because this is again human nature. We are masters of seeing everybody else's mistake. We're really good at it. No, 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 no. You get to know someone, we're good. The only one we fail royally is ourselves. So the fact that I can see every other scribe's mistake and I can pick it up just scanning within a minute, I'll pick up the whole thing. But my own, I can't. So therefore, how do you solve that? Every single mezuzah, every single tefillin, including every single Torah, has to go through Haggah. And how it's done, by the way, and this is a people often don't even get to know about this part of the checking of a Torah. When a new Torah is written, after it's completed, it actually goes through two different types of checking, but the one Haggah, which was, is with the scribes, you'll have two scribes. One reading from the Torah, he's going to read and he's going to say the word, Bereshit, Bet Resh Aleph Shin Yutaf, and someone else is looking from a tikkun, and he's hearing everything he's saying. He says, okay, good, read. Bara, Bet Resh Aleph. Good, next. And you read the entire Torah that way, word for word throughout the entire scroll. We also today do a computer check. <laughs> okay, but that does not replace the Haggah. Okay. Um, so that really answers that question as far as that's what we do today to solve those problems. Yeah. Yeah. I was telling my Bukhar here that uh, little boys like him are very important to the process of checking. And very much so. Didn't get to tell him why and how, I was hoping you could. Absolutely. So when it comes to a Torah or a mezuzah or any of those types of scripts that will have, not necessarily if it's missing or not, but rather the shape of a letter. Because if you will have a letter, and again, sorry for the times, I could do a lot of demonstrations, I have a lot more to say, depends on how long you're willing to listen. But if you have a letter, you know what, let's do it quickly here. So in the Torah, there are lines. You see those lines? I'm going to answer your question with a minor detour. Minor. OK. Can you all see that as I'm doing it? Good. Everything in this world has lines when we write. Now the question is, do you use your lines to write on top of the line or under the line? Which one is correct? We always write on top of the line. That's how we use it. If, if a student starts to write under the line, the teacher says, no, 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 you got to do it. Okay. How about in Hebrew? It's the same thing. We're supposed to write on top, not on the bottom. There's only one language in the world, ladies and gentlemen, that uses a line not as a base to write your letters, but rather as a roof to hang the letters under, and that is Hebrew. So if you're going to write the letter bet, There's a little crown, but this letter bet is, as you can see, hanging under the line. Okay, so when it comes to writing, every letter has to be in the Torah. Every letter has to be in the mezuzah. And yet, we're not talking about if a letter is missing or not, because that you don't need anyone to ask. But if you have a letter that's written like this, what letter is this? That could be a, a nun, right? 
It could be a nun. And if it's just a little bit longer, we're not sure. So often what we will do is when we have a shape of a letter, or if you'll take, for example, we all know this letter. What letter is this? A yud. But what happens if it went like this? And by the way, this is a vav. But do you see the problem here? It's a maybe. Is it a yud or is it a vav? So what do we do? People, adults, we read words. We see a whole word, our brain automatically translates that into the full word and we know what it is. Yet children, when they learn to read, they're not reading words, they're reading letters. They identify individual letters. So we actually, when we have questions in a mezuzah, if it's correct or not, or in a Torah, if it's correct or not, we call in a child who's just recently learned how to read and we ask them, and we show them there's a whole process how you show other letters, and then you eventually show this letter, and you say, what is it? And the first remark that he says, or she says, is going to identify if that is kosher or not. So there you go. So they have a very important role to play in identifying kosher. Who had a question here? Someone was? Yeah, yeah, sorry. You, oh, Ed Kratkin. Thanks for a very nice presentation. Uh, how does a, a regular sofa who's not traveling like you spend his day, and how long does it take to write a Torah? Okay, I think as a general rule, the funny thing is, is that there are not too many of us in the world. Um, sofas that write, I don't know if we're more than 150. 200 is beyond what I believe exists today. It's not a very famous profession to be in. And from that 150 or so, I don't know if there's 20 that are qualified to restore Torahs worldwide. There's not many of us. But a sofa that writes a Torah, for example, it takes an entire year to write. And if you're quick, it's 10 and a half to 11 months. <laughs> but we're talking about working not eight hours a day, but often 10 or 12 hours a day. Obviously not including Shabbat and holidays. So it's a very, you have to have a lot of patience. You have to have your brain in high gear that you can think a lot, see what you're reading, see what you're writing, and spend the time on one thing as it moves along. So it's, it's a very, it's a very um, time-consuming job that occupies your brain even more than your hand because you, has, you have to stay in tune. <laughs> you can't drift, okay? And if you picked up your phone to look at it while you're writing, the chances are when you get back to writing, you're gonna make a mistake. So often we put away our phones, we're not actually using it when we're writing because that's one of the earliest sources of mistakes that are happening these days, but yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay. I have two, one is practical and one is curious. Um, the practical one is, let's say you identify that our Torah is, there's something in it that makes it not kosher. Can it be put back into the ark until it's repaired? That's the practical question. The curious question is, I know that pe when people restore art, they try to match paints and different chemicals and things that go into those paints. Do you do anything to try to match the ink? Okay, so as far as the first question goes, a Torah, kosher or not, should always be put in the ark. Always be put in the Aron Kodesh. Um, if a Torah is not kosher, one should not be able, I mean, one can, a Torah that's not kosher is still holy. Okay, you still respect it in every single way. Other than we don't make a bracha on it because it's now not fit, if you will, just yet to be read from until restored. Okay, um, sometimes the Torah can be deemed kosher b'dieved. Kosher b'dieved is a very interesting terminology. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the word b'dieved. It's a very common used Jewish word, um, especially for human beings like us. And that is the following. I'm going to ask you a basic question. And then the second question, I think you'll all get it correctly. When you take um, the challah and you hold the challah and, you're about, and you're, going, you're about to eat it, right? So here's your two options. Do you first make the blessing and then eat it? Or do you first take a bite and then eat it? What's the correct way? We all know. You first make the blessing and then you take the bite. We all know that. Whether we understood it or remembered it, it's almost naturally. That's what we do. You make the blessing. Okay, everybody eat. When we go. Okay, fine. Wait. 
what happened if one time, and it's happened to all of us, we weren't thinking, we were distracted. We picked up the challah, we took a bite, and we go, <laughs> now what? A, you don't make a blessing because you took a bite. B, make the blessing now. What's the, what do we do now? What's the answer? No, you make the blessing now. So in other words, you took a bite. It's not the right way initially, but that's the way that we would solve it and you would still make the blessing. So listen carefully. The correct way of doing things is in Hebrew, according to the Talmud, it's called lechatchila, from the word hatchala, from the word the way you begin to do things. We make the blessing and then we eat. But the evid comes from the word avad, meaning past. But if you made a mistake and then you passed the opportunity of doing it right, you still have an opportunity to fix the situation and make the blessing right now. So, but wait, 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 wait. What happens if someone was watching you and you took the challah and you took a bite and then you made the blessing and you say, oh, is that how you do it? You're supposed to take a bite and then make the blessing? You say no. That was bidievet. We did that as the aftermath of a situation and this is how I solved it, but that's not how we initially should do it. Back to Torahs. Torahs should have all black ink. That's lechatchila. But what happens if it's like brownish into the early fading. Do we write Torahs with brownish fading ink? No. But if you have a Torah that has brownish fading ink, but the Evid, it's still okay. So when we're talking about a Torah, if it's kosher or not, sometimes you can have a Torah that's perfectly kosher, sometimes it's but the Evid, which means this is not the way it should be. We should still try to re-ink it and make it black if we can, but but the Evid, it'll pass. And that's why, unless it's not kosher, a Torah can be used. If it's crumbling and still the letters are there, you can still use it. As far as the ink goes, you're on the money, because what we often will do is that depending on which type of parchment it is written on, because glazing is very different than parchment that's not glazed, that's another whole description, we will go ahead and match the ink. And often what we'll do is I'll mix a little bit things. I have a, a few bottles of ink that I travel with, and I add this, add that, and have little, little containers of things that I go and add and make my ink until I'm happy and I will go ahead and fix it. That it will match the ingredient of the ink that was already there. So I'll, it has to mesh with the ink that's there and not kind of contradict what's there on the parchment. Yeah. Hey, this is kind of a style question. I noticed on some of the Torahs they have elongated letters or elongated words. Mm -hmm. And then some don't, right. or some lines have it and some don't. Is that a specific, you know, is there some rhyme or reason to that? Right. That's a very classical question that often we're asked. Um, actually, that question determines the value of a Torah. That question. That's one of the primary elements. When we look at a Torah to determine its value, we're going to look at that. What is that that she's referring to? And we're saying like this. The, um, all the letters have a particular shape that they have to be. I can go into, into the technicality of it, but if there was a grid, every letter is what we call a grid of three. So a bet is basically meant to be a three, and this is the top of the bet, an empty space here, and then there's gonna be three here with another half here. So this becomes the bet, okay? Now, if you added a little bit more, but if you made the bet short, now it looks like a nun, right? So most letters, you cannot go and change their shape. If you had the letter yud, as we were talking about earlier, okay, or, like, or let's say the, the letter vav, okay, so here's the letter vav. But if you now added and made the vav long like this, now it's a resh, okay? So most letters, you cannot stretch them. But some letters, no matter how long this resh is, it still has the shape of the resh. So you're able to elongate them in order to, why? Because every column, you're meant to write adjustable columns, that all the lines have to appear at the beginning and the end, and they have to be nice and even from beginning to end. Now, each line has a different number of letters in there. The, st the average is 33 letters per line, but sometimes you'll have a line that has only 28 letters, and you're <laughs> putting those letters so tight. Sometimes you'll only go and have, you know, sometimes you're gonna have, you know, 42 and your spread, depends on how many letters you're fitting in that line. Sometimes you need to stretch certain letters to make sure you fill in 
those particular lines. Now, why is that so important? Because a sofer that's writing, we know, by the way, I didn't mention this earlier, remember we said a sofer is derived from the word sefer. Did you also know that the word sofer is the same root as the word sipur, which means to tell a story? The original scribes were not only glorified calligraphers, but they were storytellers. They would tell the story of the Torah as they were writing it. But the word sofer also comes from the word mispar, which is numbers, and lispor, which means to count. A, a sofer who's now accredited and is experienced knows the number of letters every line before they write. So you have to start calculating, am I going to stretch? Am I going to put it in? And to try to make every single line even, you make them evenly rather than writing them all tight and then taking one letter and stretching it to the end. So when you have too many of those letters, that's often a beginner scribe who is not trained enough in making all the lines nice and even. When you have a Torah that you look through and there's no stretched lines, it's because they've already trained in counting letters and therefore adjusting the length of each letter to fit an adjustable way every single line. So that was a very good one. Wonderful. Well, thank okay. you. I want to give... Um, Rabbi Moshe Druin, you know, a round of applause for sharing all of this amazing knowledge with us. And we're going to get a chance to actually go see. So sure. if you want to head back there so that you can be ready. Yeah. Uh, but in, in, um, in uh, see, being respectful of his time, given the fact that he still has many Torah to, Sifrei Torah to go over, yeah. um, we're going to be able to only be in there for about 10 minutes. So... But I did want to make sure that you got back there, was ready to set okay. up so that we could come in and sort of see the setup of what we have as a community. Again, Absolutely. this is a community impact grant in action. And thank you, um, Temple Emanuel, for writing it on behalf of the community. And we were very um, happy to be a part of it. And we have learned so much from you. So thank you, well, thank you. so very much. So um, when we leave here, if you want to go into the room with the Sifrei Torah, um, it'll be sort of around the Corner. So, um, Kim, do you want to sort of stand over there to sort of direct people in that direction? Um, that would be great. Thank you so very much.